special in many respects to dedicate the Doing Gender Lecture series to our um, honorary graduates, because we thought that for the masters and the research master students and also for the PhD students in the program, it might be very interesting to hear more about what happened with our uh, graduates uh, from both the research master program and from the PhD program. And we have quite a few who have very interesting um, uh, things to tell, very interesting things which happened since they left the program. Although you never leave the program, actually. Uh, we, are, <laughs> we all remain in touch in this global gender studies community. But uh, the gender studies series, as we said last time, uh, the doing uh, gender uh, lecture series are meant for the students and for the staff to, to be informed uh, by experts in the field about their way of doing gender. So the question actually to every speaker is, how are you doing gender in your research? What kind of knowledge do you produce? How does the intersectional approach provide knowledge which you would not have seen if we wouldn't have uh, approached the topic through the lens of gender and intersectional analysis. So that's the question to all of the speakers. Um, and today we are so very happy uh, to have our very own Phoebe Mbasalaki in our midst. Phoebe is an old friend of the program in all kind of different roles. Um, she graduated from the research master in the context of a GEMMA program in 2011. So that's, uh, <laughs> she's quite a senior alumni already. Uh, and she studied with us in, in Utrecht and in Hull. So she has the double degree Hull uh, Utrecht. And already then she stood out as a very, very um, a remarkable student with interesting analytical uh, views and a very um, exemplary way of applying literature to concrete uh, issues. So we were very happy to hear that she wanted to pursue her career as a PhD student in Utrecht. And we applied together with Gloria Wecker for a NWO grant, which you all know is something which a lot of you also would like to apply for and it's qu quite competitive to get but guess what phoebe did get this grant from the netherlands research council so that she could she was paid to do her phd research for four years in the gender studies program and in the same at the same time she was invited um, to teach in in several courses in the program so she became both a researcher and a lecturer um, at the department of gender studies in utrecht where she, in the end, in 2018, two years ago, no, even three years ago now, it was in January 2018, mm -hmm. so three years ago, she defended her PhD on the lived experiences of black township women in same-sex relations. And this PhD was set, and th these issues will come up in the lecture today again, I, I, uh, I presume. The PhD is set against the backdrop of a country, South Africa, with one of the on uh, on the one hand one of the most progressive constitutions in the world so that's very interesting um thing to start with uh, in south africa but uh, at the same time uh south africa has high levels of uh, unemployment but more specifically interesting for us here today also homophobia uh so in her research, Phoebe demonstrated how township women, and act being both African, uh, being loyal to the African standards, and homosexual, while occupying a uh, predominantly heterosexual space. So you feel already that um, uh, Phoebe has this sort of fascination with these kind of difficult combinations, uh, uh, very impossible identity constructions. And I'm quite sure we will more hear more about that in the lecture today. Um, now, in 2021, Phoebe is a postdoctoral fellow and lecturer at the African Gender Institute at the University of Cape Town, the university where the uh, um, Fees Must Fall movements uh, started. And I think that Phoebe will 
talk a little bit about that too. It's one of the most prestigious universities of the um, of the continent of the of, of the African continent, I would say. So that's uh, quite a a great place to be at the moment. And the research, the context, the project where she's in, uh, engaged in is the project of global grace. And that also is the result of her work in the Gemma program, because she's now working again with the people from Hull and also the people from Utrecht, because we're part of that project too. Um, so you see how those networks might uh, um, guide you through the landscape of your research career. So now uh, Phoebe is doing the research um, on how uh, sex workers negotiate their identities in the current uh, South Africa and how the arts can play a role in uh, playing out all the intricacies and the complexities there. And she will tell us more about that in a minute. Um, and maybe, uh, oh yeah, I still, still have some uh, organizational things to say. Phoebe will deliver a lecture in a minute for all of us. Um, and I'm pretty sure that there are a lot of things uh, which come up which you want to ask, or maybe after already uh, after you've read the, the article which Phoebe recommended you to read. And we will use the chat for you to write whatever you want to write and want to ask. And then in the Q&A, you have the option to, Phoebe would prefer, by the way, to turn on your camera and your mic and ask the question. Or if you find that too intimidating, you can also um, do it through the chat. Uh, so that's after, I think, how, how long would you speak? Three quarters of an hour, 40 minutes or something, probably. Um, and then I, for now, for the lecture, it might be the best for uh, for the audience to turn off your mic and your camera because then we have uh, Phoebe on the full screen. Phoebe, uh, the floor is yours and I'm excited to listen to you. Thank Any you. Comment? Thank you so much, uh, Rosemary, for such a generous uh, introduction. It's such a privilege to be back <laughs> um, uh, at Utrecht, um, uh, even though remotely. And I think uh, the one thing um, Rosemary, I guess, forgot to emphasize is that uh, she was one of my supervisors during um, uh, my doctoral research uh, at Utrecht University. So it was a pleasure um, uh, working with both Rosemary and uh, Gloria Vecca on my project. Um, so I'm going to um, try and project. I have a presentation prepared so that it's not just me talking, especially because um, the kind of work we do is so um, uh, embedded in the arts that um, uh, it only makes sense to share uh, some of it uh, visually. Um, if for any reason I um, uh, disappear or go off um, or you don't hear me properly, please um, alert me um, uh, either, you know, by speaking out or something like that. Okay. So um, I'm going to open, uh, or oh, I'm opening with, um, uh, uh, you know, an iconic image. Uh, from uh, the Roads Must Fall movement that Rosemary mentioned uh, that started in 2015 at the University of Cape Town, um, you know, which is um, uh, an elitist institution, as uh, Rosemary mentioned earlier, where, you know, um, this was an unprecedented kind of protest from students, uh, one that never ha has had never had that magnitude before. And in this image, um, the lady in the middle is um, was a student then at uh, with the African Gender Institute in the Gender Studies program. Her name is Masse. Uh, she later on uh, ended up working as a um, you know research and project manager on one of the uh, pro um, research programs there, projects there. Uh, but she's one of 
um, the many leaders um, uh, within the Roads Must Fall movement that ensured that it was an intersectional movement that uh, brought in um, diversity along the lines of sexuality, gender, and um, class. Um, for instance, there was, you know, a huge um, queer representation, trans, uh, and the like. And, um, you know, the other thing I open with is uh, this quote by Audre Lorde that um, uh, usually guides uh, the kind of work I do. And I guess <laughs> um, that's why I end up in, um, you know, um, work or research projects or, you know, yeah, do the work uh, that's rather difficult. Um, as Rosemary mentioned in um, uh, with my doctoral work, but also this postdoctoral work is um are really rather difficult uh, in terms of, uh, you know, in everyday encounters with marginality, marginality of utter lack, you know, uh, with working and some of our sex workers we work with are homeless and live on the streets. So um, it's not um, uh, rosy at all, but yeah, really difficult work. Uh, but this is, um, this court uh, keeps me going. Uh, this will be uh, sort of the structure of uh, the lecture today. I will uh, briefly uh, get into um, uh, my, uh, you know, the student protest that called for decolonization, and then um, I'll contextualize South Africa because that's really important to situate or locate it, and then um, engage with what I call cross-border work. Um, that uh, um, the kind of research project is engaging with, which is anti-colonial work, um, briefly um, uh, introduce the Global Grace Project and then really delve into the kind of work uh, we do. Um, I apologize, I'm using my phone as a booster and uh, so I can't turn it off into flight mode, but messages are coming in that I can't turn off. So forgive the ping. <laughs> um, and um, I'm hoping at the end uh, we'll get to watch um, uh, about uh, five minutes, if there's a bit of time, maybe longer, um, the last uh, public performance of the Sex Workers Theatre put on uh, in September, uh, which was, you know, um, in the heat uh, of COVID, um, which is uh, really uh, great work um, that came out of it. And, um, you know, just at the back of your mind, uh, keep this question in mind and we'll get back to it uh, at the end um, of the presentation. This is also a question I usually pose in the classroom and usually I situate um, uh, uh, some of the people I work with, like uh, Nicole, who's a homeless genderqueer sex worker, or um, Aquila, who's a trans sex worker who lives on the street. And I'm like, how can we make, um, or how can we work or think or rethink an, um, a political economy um, uh, that elevates um, uh, them as humans? Okay, so um, I have uh, chosen to engage uh, with this conversation through the rubric um, of collaboration as a praxis by grounding it into located examples in broad strokes, briefly touching on the students' protest in 2015, and then the work I refer to as um, collaboration across structural borders. In other words, uh, collaboration as a praxis, you know, a doing, you know, so this is how, um, you know, this will be an elaboration of how we do gender here, you know. I have been grappling a lot with collaboration um, across borders or structural borders, especially because uh, the current project I'm working on is embedded in this. What is at stake when institutions with historically institutionalized power, um, such as elite universities like the University of Cape Town, where I'm located, collaborate in research projects with subaltern communities like sex workers, who really benefits. So some or most of you may have heard um, or even closely followed uh, the student protests in South Africa in 2015, 
a significant moment that reignited anti-colonial work. As a matter of fact, those protests started here. And then they characterized uh, this time of student protests in higher education as a negative moment, one that is experienced in all large scale societal changes. So a negative moment, he says, is a moment when new antagonisms emerge while old ones remain unresolved, when contradictory forces inchoate, fractured, frag fragmented are at work, but what might come out of their interaction is anything but certain. A negative moment, however, is also creates the conditions for a deep re-examination of current hegemony and for a reimagining of how to shape the outcome of that interaction. And in this sense, it is important to unpack the contestations around the curriculum, what strands of thinking inform the call for the decolonization thereof, what antagonisms they signify, and what visions of a positive and more coherent future can be discerned in them. So the Rosmas Four Mission Statement characterize this form of alienation as black pain, which the student activists defined as dehumanization of black people informed by the violence exerted only on black people in a system that privileges whiteness. As a radical feminist and student, um, a radical feminist and student activist, when Elisa Kava put forth in one of her Facebook posts in June 2018, getting an education is violent, hard, and demoralizing for the black child. At the same time, Kaaba noted how, while the student movements challenge the university, this is situated in South Africa, um, which um, is a colonial state that inflicts structural violence on the poor and black South African slaves. Noting that South Africa has a history of 400 years of colonialism and 50 years of apartheid, and in, this, in its contemporary formation, 80% of the land and capital uh, is controlled by mostly the white minority. So indeed, these are the co contradictions that Rosemary was speaking to earlier. So on the one hand, South Africa has one of the most progressive constitutions in the world. Yet on the other, it remains aspirational to people of color. Um, for instance, it's inaccessible by black people of um, intense-sex relationships, which um, was uh, the basis of my doctoral work. But this constitution is also inaccessible for sex workers, where uh, sex work is still criminalized in South Africa. And on the other hand, South Africa holds a significant, um, holds its own within uh, the global economy emergence, although that might change with COVID. Um, but it was a member of the G20. And yet, um, uh, Black and brown people remain on the margins of this economy. So where do the violences lie in this? Yeah? The call for decolonization, and um, this really gives a clear image of um, you know, which constituencies hold the economy and who is on the margins of it. Uh, so the call for decolonization is a recognition that the past filters into the present. And um, Sylvia Tamale, in her latest book on decolonization, therefore notes that um, decolonization and decolonial projects demand an in-depth appreciation of history of colonization and all its supporting discourses. Tamale adds that it's only with such a comprehension that there can be a successful extraction, rather extraction from the bondage of colonialism and domination. It is it's especially necessary to be alive and alert to the histories of normative concepts that are presented as ahistorical, universal, and neutral, including human rights, race, gender, family, the, and the law, all of which filter or trickle into knowledge production. At the same time, Tamale cautions that colonialism did not mean the same thing for women and men, for rulers and subjects, for dominant groups, uh, versus ethnic minorities. It also meant different things in different contexts. Um, what happened under British rule, for instance, in Nigeria looks quite different from what happened in Botswana. So um, this calls for a nuancing 
when uh, dealing with uh, the narrative of coloniality and decolonization that has to be contextually located. So noting these complexities, decolonization calls for an analysis of histories that root the empire and oppression. Uh, we know that the contemporary neoliberal discourse have not have one fundamental blind spot. It treats the present as if the present had no history, so it's a historical. Uh, in Sylvia Tamale's recent book that I mentioned earlier, she notes an old saying that goes, the past is never dead, it's not even the past. Hence decolonization and decolonial projects demand an in-depth appreciation of history of colonization and all its supporting discourses and how this filter into the present. This is what Gloria Becker frames as, um, as a cultural archive. So for Becker, the content of what the cultural archive overlaps, the colonial archive as a repository of memory, as well as principles and pra practices of governance in the heads and hearts of the people in the metropole, but its content is also silently cemented in policies and organizational rules, in popular and sexual cultures, and in common sense everyday knowledge, all based on years of, of so you know, hundreds of years of imperial rule. Therefore, it's a habituation of the past and present. Uh, decoloniality calls for centering and interrogating what it means to be human or non-human, one that contextualizes regimes of power along the grammars of race, class, gender, sexuality, ableism, uh, religion, Structural systems of injustice, oppression, and inequality have created what bell hooks refers to as the imperialist, white supremacist, capitalist patriarchy, which are interlocking systems that work together to uphold and maintain cultures of domination. This is what frames what it means to be human, non-human, one that's emblematic of regimes of power rooted within whiteness and heterosexuality, where race is a fundamental organizing grammar of social reality, it is therefore in this construction that we see the language of violence enacted on those who fall outside um, the normative or the privileged status. This language of violence has been ongoing for centuries and is therefore firmly established and perverse and plays out in everyday experiences of being human or non-human. This language of violence is in the physical and structural manifestation penetrates everyday experiences of access to healthcare, socioeconomic and psychosocial possibilities mentioned by a few. So a call for decolonization also um, needs to be aware of the trans or cross-disciplinarity as a way of acknowledging the complexities of being human rather than, you know, being boxed in uh, disciplines um, as that's very limiting. A call for uh, decolonization addresses questions of representation and knowledge production. The language of violence has gravely manifested in research and knowledge production pertaining to those who have been, who are formerly colonized, with gross misrepresentation legitimized as knowledge. You know, the story of Sarah Batman is a renowned example, and Rosemary um, Abakima has written uh, a bit on this and her work on representation. So, Decolonization also calls for collaboration as praxis. Um, Professor Cornell West points out as one that is rooted within freedom and justice and aims to see the world through the lens of the most marginalized or oppressed. He refers to this as revolutionary love, and it's something I usually tend to pick on in my work. In other words, research that is in service um, of the communities in which the universities are located. So when speaking of collaboration, I'm reminded of what feminist scholar Richa Negar, whose article on collaboration across borders brings out uh, a number of issues. Uh, she speaks of the inability to align theoretical priorities with the concerns of the communities whose struggles we want to advance. She posits that if our goal is to transform the power hierarchies embedded in knowledge production, it is clearly not going to happen merely through discussion of how we represent others and ourselves. We need a, what we need is a revamping of the theoretical frameworks so that 
the stories and struggles we write about do not become completely inaccessible and meaningless uh, to the people whose sociopolitical agendas we want to support or advance. What we need is what we need to do instead is to engage in a serious and honest examination of why the existing possibilities of framing and analyzing the stories of communities we work with contribute little or nothing towards achieving their struggles. What is it that the most sophisticated and complex theories when translated into an an accessible language fail to deliver anything beyond a fairly obvious message. What are the possibilities of extending and revamping this? So what this, what this calls for is a rethinking of site strategies and skills deployed to produce such collaboration. It means paying attention to specific processes through such collaborations can find their form, content and meaning. And therefore, it means being accountable to the people's own struggle of self-representation and self-determination, taking note of and what through the tensions and contradictions between academic and non-academic realms, speaking the theoretical and political language that goes beyond the academy, production of different kinds of products that reach different audiences, and it hinges on the communities we're working with, and their ability to draw sustenance, hope, direction, and a sense of fulfillment from this collaboration and from our ability to deploy insight uh, from feminist theories that contextually work to reach that goal. So this is the backdrop within which um, our research uh, or research work that I'm going to talk about is framed. And here I'll get into the research um, project. Uh, with a group of sex workers in Cape Town, South Africa, which we know, and rather, as we know, collaboration can be very complicated and messy sometimes and not neat. So my aim is not to rehash uh, a critical analysis of previously attempted or problemized uh, cross-border crossings, nor to perpetuate an uncomfortable romancing of collaboration across borders or difference but rather to offer the examples of the complexities, <laughs> complexities and messiness um, of uh, this collaboration. So this research project was conceptualized after the World Must Fall um, movement and therefore was conscious of what was at stake um, in South Africa. Uh, the Global Gender and Cultures of Equality project is a transnational project consisting of six work packages in countries, um, in six countries, uh, namely South Africa, Bangladesh, the Philippines, Brazil, Mexico, and the UK. Uh, the work package I'm working on is in South Africa, and it's the one I'm going to focus on here. Uh, it deploys participatory theatre as the main research methodology. The project is entitled um, Participatory Theatre and, and the Production of Cultures of Equality Among Sex Workers in South Africa, a collaboratory project between the African Gender Institute and the Center for Theatre, Dance and Performance Studies at the University of Cape Town, as well as an NGO, the Sex Workers Education and Advocacy Task Force, SWEAT in short. This work is embedded in sweats, you know, the NGO's work of what could be called radical approaches uh, to creative activism framed within destigmatization and decriminalization of sex work in South Africa. Although funding is, the funding is primarily from the UK, this research takes on board anti-colonial work uh, reignited by the students at the University of Cape Town in 2015 the kind of anti-colonial work that brings forth some elements of epistemic justice, anti-colonial work that calls for the university to be in service of the communities in which it is located. We are working with a core group of eight diverse um, street-based sex workers uh, who are trans, gender, queer, gay, lesbian, cisgender, bi and heterosexual over a period of two years. Well, it was meant to be two years, but uh, trickled into two and a half with a COVID interu interruption. And they're being trained over a period of two and a half years um, in skills in theatre and performance, such as forum theatre, 
physical theater, spoken word, and each uh, training module lasts about three months and culminates uh, in a public performance. And the idea is of launching an independent sex workers theater group at the end of the project. So in South Africa, the participatory um, in South Africa, the participatory theatre is engaged to learn from existing initiatives sex workers have used to challenge systems of sexual violence and raise the aspiration and self-confidence of people who undertake sex work in order to sustain themselves and others. This entails examining representations of how sex workers are attempting to produce equality and challenge inequality and injustice and enhance decision-making structures in their daily lives. Uh, the project considers the production of cultures of inequality by um, exploring the main question of um, what does almighty equality and well-being look and feel like in sex workers in South Africa. So by employing a multi-sensory uh, and theatre methods, the group of sex workers brought together through SWEAT, SWEAT the NGO, uh, we are paying attention to how spaces of labour, the devaluing of women's work, violence against women, health and illness and taboo surrounding sex work, and the effects of discriminatory laws and the moral judicial economy produce inequality and injustice. Um, in the sex workers' lives and affect their well-being uh, and socio and economic opportunities. So what the theatre and performance as a methodology, um, as a methodology, as a research methodology, as well as a tool for activism and social change, in addition to methodologies worked with targeting well-being of sex workers who are bravely neglected. Um, uh, where deployment of strategies such as restoring contribute towards healing and embodied and psychosocial justice, as Sarah and I um, will theorize or have theorized. So um, just to um, give you uh, snippets of the kind of work SWEAT does, the NGO, it really does uh, great work around, um, you know, championing the rights of sex workers. It's been around for about 20 years and it started in Cape Town and has expanded um, both nationally and continentally. And uh, earlier on I was talking about histories filtering into the present and we see that the Sexual Offences Act or the act used to criminalize sex work now um, emerged in the 1970, 1957 uh, during apartheid. So this is a continuity um, of marginalization that we see in the present. So the law um, uh, is very hard to prove around criminalization of sex work. So um, enforcement officers work with um, bylaws and I'll get into uh, the examples of this in the next slide. So here the constitution and rights have limits um, in terms of protection of all citizens or supposedly all citizens. Um, sex workers falling outside of that. So it's a combination of the um, uh, judicial and uh, moral economy that uh, situates sex workers in the margins because there's a strong, um, the moral order strongly manifests um, in stigmatization of sex workers. So this is um, uh, some of the examples of Sweat's work um, around um, creative activism. On um, uh, the extreme left is the Ask a Sex Worker booth. Uh, and this, the aim of this was to create dialogue and get to know sex workers who are usually abject, you know, especially homeless street um, sex workers or stereotyped and stigmatized, uh, you know, relegated to the non-human realm. And um, the idea was to develop a dialogue. The idea of this was to develop a dialogue. So, you know, uh, you know, the, the community or people can get to know who sex workers are, you know, and offer some form of dignity and humanization. So this both was placed uh, in various neighborhoods in Cape Town and, you know, passers-by could just walk uh, and speak to the sex workers and ask any questions they had. And they also gave out uh, condoms and leaflets to 
uh, whoever passed by and asked questions as a way of uh, cultivating that knowledge. The second image um, looks at, um, um, a, a, you know, a foreign theatre performance around uh, police brutality in relation to sex workers. I think the article I sent you that you were meant to read really gives statistics around that where sex workers really suffer at the hands, not only of the community, but uh, law enforcement officers because um, it's uh, criminalized. Um, uh, so uh, the narrative of violence is very rife in physical, in uh, sexual, and in harassment. Uh, and this was an enactment of that. And on the extreme right, um, it's a continuation of that enacting police brutality. So in the previous slide, I mentioned bylaws that are used to arrest sex workers. Uh, one of them, utterly ridiculous, is that if you're um, a law enforcement officer finds you and stops you and searches your bag and finds that, you know, you have more than four condoms, then you're said to be a sex worker and you're thrown into jail. So um, this image says, look at me, I'm dangerous. South Africa treats condoms as evidence of crime. You know, I mean, it shows the ridiculousness of, you know, how the judicial system works. Uh, to further marginalized marginal communities. So um, given, um, uh, you know, what we're dealing with, um, I'm going to evoke uh, a couple of critical thoughts um, and moments, having laid out um, uh, the backdrop uh, within which um, sex workers are situated and which we're working, you know, I started with the university and then moved on to, you know, uh, South Africa in general. Um, so some critical moments um, uh, we had to deal with in this project is around funding, funding from the North, how geopolitics of funding work, uh, given the North-South um, nexus of complications in terms of impositions, both explicit and implicit, rooted in histories of white capital. Funding in South Africa for such projects would be difficult to source on the other hand, <laughs> as such projects have to rely on external funding. So this is, you know, um, one of uh, the complexities we had to work with, or, you know, we're working with them, you know, uh, dealing with so lots of negotiations uh, around that. The other is uh, the complexity of NGO, um, uh, acad and academy, you know, the NGO academy dynamic uh, relationship that's imbued in histories of, of hierarchization. For instance, sex workers um, were not part of the team that was consulted in the conceptualization of the project, but rather brought on board later in, as after the project started. So consultation at the conceptualization of the project was mostly through sweep management. You know, who gets to sit at the table then? And the other uh, complexities around with working with precarious lives, street best sex workers, some of whom are homeless uh, with material needs and survival uh, ever present. So this indeed calls for cross-border work. And this cross-border work has brought about the following. Uh, dialoguing, you know, difficult conversations, may I add, which are at times very, very uncomfortable. So we set up um, what we call um, a sex worker-led uh, steering committee, which um, uh, is consulted on the day-to-day -day running of the project. Um, these difficult conversations started at the beginning of the project uh, with the steering committee, where indeed uh, there were challenges around why uh, sex workers themselves, for instance, were not part of the conversation around the conceptualization of the project. The other very difficult, complex conversation we had to deal with was around funding and monies, where, you know, us in the academy get, you know, travel money for conferences, for, you know, um, a huge research budget. Uh, whereas, you know, um, what was budgeted for sex workers was a stipend, very small. I think it was about two pounds or something like that for each encounter, which is barely anything. 
So we had to have really difficult conversation around this and we had to go into a budget uh, to try and um, offer something that's dignified. Uh, because as I said earlier, one of the complexities is working with um, uh, you know, marginalized living on the streets, so survivors, um, uh, you know, it has to be factored into such a research project. Um, six workers are co-researchers and co-creators um, of knowledge production. Uh, and this kind of knowledge production is a non-traditional mode of knowledge production in that it's embodied, told through the life narrative of um, sex workers, it's about storytelling. So, and offers, you know, a non-conventional mode uh, of knowledge production that's told through the lives of sex workers, by sex workers. And of course, due to requirements or academic requirements, there are, you know, um, journal articles and the like that have to come out. But this is the central bulk of it. And the idea is to launch an independent sex workers theatre company at the end of the project, um, producing a different kind of knowledge, um, you know, framed uh, within um, a decolonial project. Um, you know, and the narratives coming out of that, uh, like I said, are around restoring, remembering, which is offering moments of humanization, and what we're theorizing as embodied social justice, all framed within well-being, and of course, um, uh, creative activism around decriminalization and destigmatization of sex work. Now, I'm going to give you a flavor of, um, uh, you know, the kind of work we've been doing because we're already now over two years with this um, theater group. Um, and uh, we've done three modules with them to date. Uh, the first module um, was uh, Forum Theatre or Theatre of the Oppressed, um, which some of you may or may not know of, that comes from Brazil. Um, it's Boal's work. Um, and that uh, module lasted about four months and it culminated in a performance called Intando Yam, which is Isikosa, My Choice in English. Um, the second module that was the, the first module started the first half of 2019 and the second module was in the second half of 2019. The second module was based around was based on um, physical theater. The article I shared to read was um, uh, a result of that in um, uh, one of the elements of it. Uh, in relation to a Japanese dance called Buto, which had absolutely profound um, effects on the group. Um, and of course, uh, Jackie Job is also amazing, an amazing dancer and um, uh, a scholar who who did the module. Um, I had uh, the privilege of watching her dance uh, two Sundays ago, and it's just absolutely profound. There's no words to describe it. Uh, and this, indeed, it was so embodied um, uh, that um, it got um, the group to take a moment and get into their bodies um, uh, and reconnect. Um, so th the second module on physical theatre had various elements to it, and um, it was directed, the final performance um, it was called Yeki Hambe. And in Isikosa, let it go in English, it was directed by Iman Isaacs. And um, these are certain aspects of um, the second performance. Um, if any of you would like to watch, it's out there in the public. It's on the Global Grace um, uh, website or YouTube channel um, and a few other um, mediums where we've put it as um, part of our um, uh, awareness raising or you know presentations and conferences or exhibitions or something like that so there are you know mediums where you can watch it if you're interested really profound work this is an image from a bridge performance that happened um in november 2019 against um gender-based violence so uh, the sex work theater group was on the bridge performing and the procession came and passed us under the bridge and went to Parliament, it was absolutely profound as well. And um, this, the third performance, uh, which was entitled COVID Wahid, that's Afrikaans for COVID's truth, um, uh, happened um, 
last year. It was meant to be just the beginning of, you know, from the beginning to middle last year, but then um, COVID uh, interrupted us and, um, you know, spoken word became the only module we engaged with last year because of COVID. And I'm going to show you uh, five minutes of it. Um, uh, so you get to see the kind of work they do. But here I have images of uh, the group preparing. You see, um, uh, it was a hybrid of home-based and, um, you know, theatre based in the space for our homeless sex workers who couldn't do the work on the street but needed, a, you know, a contained space to engage with the work. Um, and um, uh, Jason is sitting across uh, Nomsa on the top right. Um, he's the one who directed an amazing, amazing poet and theatre maker. So one of the privileges for me as an outsider has been, you know, seeing how this work evolves and how theatre is profound in um, its narrative of, of knowledge production. So let me know if this works or if you hear or see it. We're going to watch um, five minutes of it. Maybe we we see, but we don't hear anything. Can you hear that? Which is at the top deck in Cape Town. 
As I was coming from there, I passed the Wi Fi hotspot and sat there for a moment to download the movie. I was waiting for my phone to finish downloading. And I saw this guy approaching me. His name is Conan, normally known as X. He came to me and asked if not me and I'm sitting here with my phone. And I am not just scared of this. What is my problem? I answered him back. Yes, I am. Yes, I am. Yes, I am. Yes, I am. It is a long, dark night. We need houses around the street corners, faceless and appear. But they have a need, fetish, a dream, or a fantasy, and by far emotional interaction. The stress reliever, a social worker, or just a listener, and a fiction. And a baby, some love and affection. Handsome rewards gifted for fetish, a dream, or a fantasy, which is above all. No speed catch, no guilt. Services rendered, job well done. Rewarded with dollars abundance, both happy and blissfully made. Five and six more models, still intact. Okay, so uh, due to time, um, I'll end there uh, and move on to the next slide. Um, but this. Uh, performance or play reading um, that came from, um, you know, that spoken word module was centered on a monologue. So um, Aquila seated in the middle telling her monologue and the other narratives or poetry is waved um, in between um, uh, this monologue. And the monologue is around um, Aquila being um, nagged. Uh, Aquila is our transsex worker who lives in the street. Now, you know, with COVID, we had to, you know, continue work, but also support the sex workers. So we had to buy them phones and, and put, you know, internet and all that on there. Uh, and Aquila um, uh, is telling of what happened to her on one evening um, uh, of Women's Day in South Africa where uh, she was mad and nearly killed uh, because of the phone she had. Um, so uh, it was a really traumatic, violent moment um, uh, that shook us all as a group, that you know, it shows a violence is ever present um, uh, in the lives of sex workers. Um, and Instead, uh, she chose to write about it as a monologue. And through this um, retelling of the story, she says uh, it brought about elements of healing, you know, dealing with it, dealing with that trauma, uh, and um, offering some element of what we call embodied social justice, Diana, um, which is um, healing. Now, how do we get to that point of um, the nine modern um, that Lagoon is uh, mentions of? You know, um, anti-colonial work across uh, structural borders therefore calls for a rethinking around puncturing borders of the entanglement of coloniality, heteropatriarchy, um, capitalism, and whiteness. In what shape and form does it take them? My take is that. It is invisible on and on society political everyday micro resistance from those structures um, and often goes unnoticed because of their lack of grandness. I connect this to mundane everyday encounters present in the micro form. So given their presence is micro is in micro aspects which often go unnoticed, how can we ensure this present visibility is maintained? rather than disappearing off uh, after a while, which is often the case. Like all projects, uh, funding for this project has a time limit um, and uh, will soon come to an end. How can this momentum gained, even though at an interpolitical level, uh, be sustained? For us, we hope this can continue uh, through the launch uh, of an independent 
uh, sex workers here to company. And then I go back to um, uh, the question I posed earlier to ponder on, and perhaps that we can all reflect on. Um, how can we rethink a political economy in a given context? Uh, perhaps we can take a moment to have a, a critical look in, our, in the context in which we are located, where institutional racism and heteropatriarchy manifest through the language of violence um, and the disposition uh, for the other along the grammars of race, gender, class, sexuality, ability, and perhaps try to reimagine an alternative mode of equitable existence how can the university you are located at be in service of your community in its wholeness along the grammars of race, gender, uh, class, sexuality, ableism, disability, religion, and do anti-colonial work uh, through cross, um, uh, cross, crossing structural borders, as in doing the difficult work and not um, just about um, the talk, but getting into the doing. So I thank you uh, for your time and um, uh, listening to me. This is the Sex Workers Theatre Group. Thank you, uh, Phoebe. This was really an enlightening lecture. It was a pleasure for me to see your passion about this new research. So that was really uh, heartwarming and um, yeah, it was great to see how your uh, the occupations which were so so central to all your previous projects come across again in a different uh, form here. So that is a it's very nice to see the consistency and the knowledge which you're producing throughout your career since the past ten years now. <laughs> and I think what you beautifully. Um, uh, illustrated here is something which is also so central to the gender studies program and that is the, the capacity of the arts to epitomize uh, justice and to demonstrate to a what you I think what you what your project shows how you can demonstrate to a larger public mm -hmm. um, that the access to laws and civil rights Mm -hmm. are easier for some than for others and that's particularly not evident to a majority of the South African uh, people like sex workers so I think that uh, that claim is came across beautifully um, in your research and in your performance and I'm very curious to hear more about that mm -hmm. um, but another thing of course which is also very crucial to your um, message here is that these kind of injustices were already built in in the setup of the projects that you gave on that project. So that's, I, I think, also a very important knowledge uh, which is already produced um, in this cooperation across borders and also could set an example for other project uh, setups. So um, very important work. Um, I'm pretty sure, but I, can I see the chat? Um, don't you? Do we have already questions in the uh, chat? <clears throat> we actually don't. Um, okay. I was actually typing one now, but yeah. uh, if you want to continue with your question, Rosemary, then I'll, I'll formulate mine uh, while the other warm up. So while the others warm up, if you always need to let sink it in a little bit. Because um, it's so different. <laughs> from, um, well, I, I think in terms of methodology, it's not that different, but in terms of the case, the, 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 the empirical uh, case might need a little bit of uh, further explanation. but. I have a lot of questions, but they are uh, a little bit also about details. One of the details which struck me very much um, was the photo which you showed um, uh, to illustrate the criminalization of sex workers. Mm -hmm. And I didn't know that, that apparently if you have more than five, four condoms in your uh, back sack that you are considered to be sex worker. I was wondering how does the South African government reconcile this law when mm -hmm. the last time I was there, 
you saw these kind of billboards wear a condom as uh, 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 yeah the prevention of uh, HIV, of course. So there was just this uh, this advertising for a condom. So I I was wondering, do you have any information about that? Are people stressing this? Hey, I thought we were asked to wear condoms, and now we are criminalized when we wear condoms. How about that? Indeed, uh, that's a very important contradiction that you pull out, Rosemary. And especially for sex workers, condoms is, you know, uh, with the HIV movement, because they are in development terms, termed uh, the key population. Um, condoms are encouraged and pushed. In fact, you know, um, when other communities don't have access to free condoms, you know, the service providers that work with sex workers we, you know, um, receive free condoms from various entities from, you know, uh, the UN and uh, the government and others, the government issues <laughs> condoms out to them. And yet, you know, indeed, law enforcement work, uh, officers um, uh, pick up on that narrative as a bylaw to uh, criminalize sex work. Um, uh, but, you know, the law enforcement officers who um, uh, do this um, uh, uh, criminalization or uh, picking up of people who, are, who they suspect to be sex workers, they know that they are street-based sex workers because, you know, the street-based sex workers are homeless and um, most of them are homeless and they're known in the corners in which they stand. So this is... Uh, to them uh, embedded within the narrative of violence and victimization where they go specifically and um, pick up uh, those um, particular um, that particular group uh, and throw them in jail I've never been stopped and searched to see what's in my bag mm -hmm. for them because mm -hmm. I'm, I'm an ordinary citizen whereas Rebembo uh, in the sex workers theater group uh, she constantly gets stopped because you know the Law enforcement officers know, you know, the kind of work uh, she does. So um, uh, uh, it's about victimization <laughs> uh, within that language of violence. And uh, the important thing to mention here as well is that during um, uh, COVID uh, last year, um, uh, the Western Cape actually passed more uh, victimizing laws or bylaws uh, that victimized marginal communities more because, you know, they had this opportunity where everybody was, you know, um, preoccupied with COVID and not paying attention to what was going on. Um, that, you know, um, there's more um, such bylaws um, like, that are ridiculous like this one uh, around uh, marginal communities. Um, so that's also another point uh, of concern. Um, Uh, I have more questions, but maybe first, Domi. Yes, I was. <clears throat> I was. Thank you. I was trying to write it, but I'm gonna try and and ask it uh, orally. Um, well, I was. I was curious to hear more uh, from where your talk kind of ended. So maybe it's a little bit more about um, the conditions of this research becoming possible and, and the possible continuation of this kind of approach or different knowledge production. So I was wondering if you do have an answer to your own questions as in how do we make sure that the universities can be a space to stimulate this kind of uh, knowledge productions in different ways? If you have ideas and maybe as a liminal question to that also, um, do you feel that in the university where there were like the revolts of the last uh, couple of uh, well, couple of years ago, do you feel that that may produces a a, a produced a change in those universities in terms of becoming more attuned to being connected with the local communities or with, I don't know, activists' um, research? Mm. I'll st thank you, Domitila, for that question. I'll start with the latter and then filter into the former. So, um, to put it bluntly, this kind of research wouldn't have happened <laughs> before roads must fall. Um, so, indeed, um, uh, the student uh, movement really uh, brought about a deep introspection um, uh, within the university, but especially, you know, in other spaces more than others. Uh, in the gender studies department or, you know, the um, African studies department where the movement really started, there was a deep, deep reflection around, you know, what it means, what the university means to the communities, what the university means to 
um, students, um, especially students uh, that felt alienated um, uh, in the university space, who's um, yeah, who 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 didn't see their own experiences within what was being taught um, uh, within the university. So it was through that that such research, you know, emerged through a deep reflection of what is, you know, what is, for instance, an African decolonial feminism, you know, how do we engage, how does, um, I mean, one of the um, questions that comes up in conversation so often is that, you know, how can, you know, um, my grandmother, for instance, or someone's grandmother who's not at the university, you know, relate to the kind of work we do, <laughs> you know, and uh, the response to that is indeed, you know, doing this kind of work uh, with a the theatre group where um, uh, we, uh, uh, it communicates uh, both within the academy and outside the academy, you know, um, uh, through various forms uh, of knowledge production. Um, and especially that outside the academy is carried by um, uh, the group within the group we're working with primarily and not, you know, um, uh, through articles, which is the most conventional mean, uh, means of uh, communicating. So that way, you know, Richard Nega, who I referenced in my talk earlier, um, talks about, you know, um, communication that um, audiences um, uh, can relate to or understand. You know, theatre and performance then um, opens that or opens up that possibility. Um, the public performances initially, the very first one was amongst allies, but then we opened them up to the wider community, and the kind of conversations we have at the end are absolutely profound. In fact, we're collecting that as data to to analyze as well because you know. Um, uh, I have a friend, for instance, from the Netherlands who had never encountered, um, you know, sex work or what sex work is and came to one of the both, in fact, two public performances now. And, um, you know, uh, she's been opened up in ways unimaginable. You know, it's not just about, you know, reading and talking, but this is um, what Sarah and I theorize. It's about, you know, you know, the felt sensation it's embodied. You take away something within you, you know, that stays, you know as opposed to um, something fleeting you read and, you know, it, it disappears. So it's really powerful uh, in that regard. And indeed, that's how um, we are making um, a small <laughs> uh, footstep towards um, being in service uh, of the communities in which the university is embedded. Um, and with regards to continuity, for us, that was really thought through right from the word go, because, I, like I said, we knew what was at stake. And um, the idea is to implement an, an independent sex workers theatre company that can continue doing this kind of work because they would have been trained in skills. You know, they are also being trained in other skills like project management, how to manage finances, you know, uh, uh, group cohesion, the project, the group has a project manager. So the all the um, requirements of standing independently um, are being incorporated in this so that the theatre can go on or can go on once the global race funding ends. So um, indeed we hope there's a continuity of having such research projects within um, uh, the African Gender Institute. Um, uh, given this has opened up pathways for that. Thank you for this uh, elaborate response. I saw Naledi wanted to add something to the conversation. Hello. Hi. Hi. <laughs> um, so uh, I want to ask, because obviously as a former student of yours, um, I'm always interested in everything that you do all the time. And as per my email that um, I was like, I really wanted to know, um, because as a lot of your work is based, you know, theater and, um, you know, seeing people, speaking to people in person and how adaptation to coronavirus has impacted that. And um, how can we, you know, as people within, you know, institutions like this, um, you know, sort of adapt like like you have um 
in in ways that we can still make sort of tangible change i think yeah that was kind of the question i wanted to but also i wanted to make a comment um on your linkages to the you know um the fees must fall movements i wasn't there for rose must fall but obviously it's there for fees must fall and it was really interesting i think of the different responses, uh, <laughs> as you all know, within the different faculties. And um, I just always remember that obviously, you know, um, AGI was was big into, you know, change and all that. But I remember the English department completely changed. Um, and then other departments were like, oh, but we not, you know, like a, other faculties like, you know, uh, economics or something, you know, not, not the commerce factory. They were like, oh, we don't need to change because we're already decolonial. Mm -hmm. And I thought that was an interesting thing of like defining what decolonial is, because you think that, colon, you know, um, sort of uh, uh, humanities, uh, fees must fall really try to like emphasize it's about everywhere. <laughs> It's it's everywhere. So yeah, it was kind of like a two-parter um, sort of thing that I thought uh, wanted you to comment on. Thank you, Naledi. Good to see you. <laughs> uh, and indeed, uh, you make uh, a really important comment around you know how doing the work of you know uh, decolonization or transformation is really difficult and uh, gets uh, pushed back. Um, Indeed, you know, certain spaces were more open than others. Um, uh, the African Gender Institute uh, took it on board, uh, the Center for um, African Studies, for instance, whereas others like, you know, law or um, uh, uh, architecture um, felt uh, no need to do that. Of course, you know, remember what it's um, a neoliberal uh, capitalist university that serves <laughs> a certain kind of interest, you know. Uh, uh, that has to be maintained. In fact, um, there's, uh, if only we had time, I would speak through a number of changes that happened um, structurally uh, through, you know, the student movements um, uh, uh, institutionally as well within the university. One of them, uh, although it was in existence, it picked up moment, momentum was the Black Academic Caucus, of which I'm a member of, um, which has is really pushing transformation within the university around. Uh, decolonization. Um, uh, so the work continues, <laughs> so to speak. And now with regards to your first questions around um, effects of COVID, gosh, indeed that has been grand. Uh, Theatre and performance is indeed an embodied, <laughs> disciplined, more so than anything else. And uh, Sarah Machet, um, who's now the director of the Center for Theatre, Dance and Performance Studies, who's a, a co-research on the project, um, she said the discipline went through an existential crisis <laughs> uh, um, uh, at the beginning, you know, when COVID hit last year. I mean, how do you teach theatre and performance online? You know, <laughs> it's uh, um, uh, really hard. So they've gone through a rethink as well uh, and a reimagination of what it means to be online um, and teach a discipline that's so embodied. But uh, that's the kind of rethinking we had to go through as well um, as um, a research project where luckily we were uh, within the module of spoken words that could be translated online um, through um, uh, we had to buy sex workers phones and put credit on, like I said earlier, and WhatsApp was the primary mode in which um, we engaged with over a set time. So it was every Wednesday uh, for three hours. So um, everybody knew. So it was like a classroom. Everybody knew they had to be online. Those who were far away and those who needed to get to the theatre space would be there at the time to engage. Um, but now with the second wave that has been really harsh and lots of loss around, we've had to put all that on hold um, because the next module is really needs face-to-face um, -face, um, uh, interaction and really can't be translated online. So we're still rethinking and refiguring out how we move forward. Um, the numbers luckily are going down, so we'll see if, you know, uh, distanced face-to-face um, uh, -face is possible, but otherwise, you know, a rethinking of what next. Thank you both, Naledi and Phoebe. Mm. Are there any other questions in the public? Uh, 
perhaps um, I could pose a question to the public. <laughs> of course. Yeah. Um, in addition to what I posed earlier to Pond and Thinko, I mean, recently, um, was it last month or a couple of weeks ago, the whole Dutch uh, government resigned <laughs> out of um, uh, um, the discovery around um, uh, institutional racism that manifested um, in the social welfare um, arm of, of government. Um, and I was wondering what the reflective mode was um, within um, the public online in relation to that, <laughs> the kind of work um, that needs to be done around institutional racism. Is there anyone in the public who dares to answer that question? <laughs> so your, your question actually is, how did the public react on the reason for the um, for the government to uh, to resign? Yeah. Um, I didn't really, I'm not so active on social media because it's sometimes a bit depressing, especially in these kind of issues. But there are several things um, um, which are remarkable in this, in this phenomena. Um, I think that Black Lives Matter is, might have been a, quite a motor or sort of a, a mechanism which um, uh, accelerates uh, developments in the Netherlands. So I think one of the developments which are quite um, prominent at the moment is that there is this process going on, uh, the need that where the, the government um, acknowledges the need to apply a what they call a national uh, coordinator uh, against discrimination. Mm -hmm. um, and from 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 the gender studies group, we are involved in in that discussion with the government. And our stake is well, that's all very nice. Uh, coordinator against discrimination, it's it's mm -hmm. it's a good first step. So why not? But it also risks to um, to frame institutional racism as an incident, as a, as a as a as a yeah. Mm -hmm. So our our. Um, a recommendation is at the moment, and we're still negotiating that, that we need an authority to um, to supervise the application of Article 1 in our constitution. So it's it's a little bit of the same kind of um, mechanisms where you were talking about. We have this Article 1, it's, it's mm -hmm. forbidden to discriminate and racism is forbidden. Mm -hmm. So um, there is a, an authority in the Netherlands for financial markets, for privatization of data and so forth and so forth. Why isn't there an authority which supervises the application of the Article 1 law? So that's, that's the discussion which we are having, so mm -hmm. that it's not about uh, victims who have to uh, approach a um, coordinator, but it is about an authority who um, who supervises whether institutions apply Article One in the right way. So you you sort of turn around the problem. So that that's what is going on, and I think the reason why we um, why the government is interested in our ideas is it's, that's quite rare so we were really invited to talk with ministers and so about this um, is the combination of black lives matter and mm -hmm. this this shameful uh, uh, proof of mm -hmm. the institutional racism which is built in in, in our institutions but mm -hmm. the other the what also has to be said about this resignation and why this didn't cause such a stir was because it was only for a few weeks that they mm. were, you know, because the elections are March 17th. Yeah, yeah so um, everybody knew, well, it's it's a little bit of a symbolic uh, gesture, which had to be made, of course, like in all these kind of cases, you have to draw a line between what is acceptable and what is not. So it's important that uh, they ac that they sort of acknowledge this is not acceptable and we have to work on, on this. But at the same time, um, yeah, it was only for a few weeks 
to uh, and the, and the other thing of course is the covid context i mean people were very much uh, obsessed of course like the entire world with how the government uh, negotiated the the covid crisis strangely enough in the in the statistics uh, concerning which parties are popular and which not i think that this entire um uh yeah this debacle i would say didn't play a big role in in shifts in, in popularity of parties and that's another uh, alarming um, signal of yeah indeed, indeed. Yeah. and could they be re-elected then <laughs> that's what it means <laughs> well there is there there are one or two ministers who really sort of left the job but okay. the prime minister, yes, he could be re-elected. Gosh. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> yeah. 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 But I'm glad. But there are a lot of, of, of course, there are a lot of analysis who are um, pointing out that the, that the, um, yeah, that it is due to the policies of the past ten years. What's going on here? Um, yeah. But it's it's a small minority who is occupying that critical position at the moment. Mm -hmm. Yeah, let's hope uh, that's a toe in the door. <laughs> but, um, uh, yeah, I think it's in, in the Netherlands, like like in a lot of other places, um, that the polarization is, mm -hmm. is augmenting. So there is an increase of critical minds and there is also an increase of um, uh, willingness at in at some parties in in government to indeed to 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 do structure to to take structural measures. Mm -hmm. And other, on the other hand, we have also this alarming increase of uh, right wing and alt right discourse. So mm -hmm. that's going on. It has been uh, the the political landscape in the Netherlands um, has been much better. <laughs> Uh, no, I mean it's 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 sort of in a decline. I mean, I have, I would have never thought that we would see this here. I mean, this whole idea of being progressive and so forth—it's totally gone. Domi, I see a uh, hand. Yeah, I just wanted to say something. But one uh, one of our students, uh, Josh, also mentioned that in the chat that. In, in a lot of like popular media uh, take on the whole scandal, uh, there was no mention of institutional racism. It was more like, you know, some bad apples that did something that was like, you know, happened to be more unfair maybe to some people than others. Um, this is also what, what uh, this other person has said in the chat a little bit, um, not to put word in his mouth. But also what I noticed that on the other hand, the good thing, the slight good thing for the outlet who picked up this, this information is that they give visibility to many of the research that have been done before. For example, mm -hmm. the, the work that Control Al Delete has been doing for years for mm -hmm. kind of police profiling, uh, racial profiling by the police, at least has been giving a little bit of, it's like, you know, Maybe this is not the only time. It's not just this instance in which we see institutional racism in the Netherlands. So maybe that has brought some visibility, but I agree with what uh, has been written in the chat. I wouldn't say that now the debate that is more dominant in the Netherlands is about who, how do we deal with uh, our uh, structural racism? You know, it's more like how do we make the system functions a bit better so that somebody can control uh, better whoever does the um, benefits, right? Mm -hmm. Mm. Just, just to add to the okay. sadness of the response. But it's, it's. I think at the end of the presentation, it's, it's very, very good that you brought the problem home to the Netherlands, so that we are not <laughs> uh, risking to think, oh, far away, there yeah. are problems. But, but I think that the public knows that very well here. Yeah. But yeah. there is a lot of work to do here, and um, I think that the work which you are doing about cultures of equality, together with the other partners, mm -hmm. because that would be another question, but we have only four minutes left, but are there some, I mean, it, it's applicable to very close to home, it's around the corner, I mean, it's the 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 the, the basic claim that laws are in a, are more accessible to some than to others. And that the law is not the place um, where equality 
uh, is embodied, so to speak. I mean, it's it's a prerequisite, of course. Mm -hmm. You always have to have an institution to fall back mm -hmm. on, but you need um, you need indeed visualizations mm -hmm. embodied justice, as you call it, so nicely. Mm -hmm. to um, to point out the flaws and the inaccessibilities and the inequalities which mm -hmm. are perpetuated notwithstanding good laws and notwithstanding in the Netherlands Article 1 or the Constitution in in, um, mm -hmm. in uh, South Africa. But my question was indeed, are there any uh, to maybe to conclude with uh, good examples of projects in the global craze you know of mm -hmm. um, who nicely illustrate this point too. Mm -hmm. Indeed, um, I think everybody does really. Um, uh, I've, uh, the beauty of this project, I mean, before COVID hit, was there was a lot of exchanges and that meant spending time with the other partners. And uh, 2019, I was lucky enough to go to Brazil and spend a couple of months there to see the kind of work um, uh, they are doing. And um, their project focuses on um, black masculinities, uh, but looking at uh, state violence, um, really complex, you know, complex in that way, looking at state violence of uh, black men uh, in uh, Brazil, who, you know, um, the rates uh, I think are equivalent to the US, if not more, you know, and the kinds of um, uh, narrative surrounding um, uh, lives of young black men in Brazil and uh, their artistic module they engaged with um, one of them was uh, through graffiti so when I was there there were uh, a couple of graffiti artists uh, who were working on um, uh, two, two uh, Afro-Brazilian men and uh, two Afro-Brazilian women uh, um, engaging with graffiti as a mode of um, communication or communicating the narratives of young black men in, in favelas. Um, and it was uh, absolutely, absolutely powerful. I think the exhibition is available, um, the exhibition is available on the Global Grace site. Um, if uh, you want to have a look at it, um, they're based, the project there partners with a, muse uh, with a museum. Uh, a local museum in, in one of the big favelas in Rio called um, uh, Mare, and um, the museum is Bella Mare, uh, based in um, uh, you know, Mare, uh, the favela, and uh, the exhibition happened there, which uh, you can look at. Uh, Mexico uh, works with um, indigenous uh, Mexican women who bear the brunt of violence, uh, state and uh, gender and other structures of violence um, through disappearances and deaths. And uh, they work, uh, their methodology is also a museum, but a moving museum. They complicate the museum from walls, uh, from white walls and move it to the community. So it's a decolonized museum, so to speak, that is moving and it's loose and takes on different shapes and forms. Uh, but also around articulating the narratives of violences that indigenous uh, communities experience. Um, in the Philippines, where I was supposed to go last year but couldn't because of COVID, um, they engage with spoken word as their main um, uh, methodology uh, with a queer community, but mostly looking at gay men, young gay men. Again, yeah, the, uh, the moral order um, uh, uh, is dominant in relation to experiences of homophobia and violence, and um, spoken word becomes um, the mode within which uh, lived experiences are communicated. Again, really powerful. Um, there's uh, also their work appears on the Global Grace website if uh, people are interested to see. And Bangladesh looks at um, female construction workers, you know, who work in an extremely masculine space, dominantly masculine space, and, you know, women entering into this um, masculine space, again, on the margins, completely on the margins of society. Um, and they work with photography and film, and they've had a couple of exhibitions, actually virtual exhibitions, um, 
which uh, are available on the Global Growth website um, that you can look at as well. So really, really amazing work, um, through, you know, engaging with artistic um, practices um, in communicating or um, uh, producing knowledge uh, of marginal communities. I think that is a wonderful end of the afternoon, this, uh, mm -hmm. this advice and recommendation to visit the website of Global Grace yeah. and to, to witness the way in which the arts are um, yeah, the capable of showing the flaws of equalities of culture mm -hmm. and sh uh, sort of trying to embody alternative ways of creating justice. Mm -hmm. um, and it's only um, I hope very much that this project is only a beginning and that there will be many more projects like this to follow. And mm -hmm. uh, you already now recommended the people here in the Netherlands to investigate the case <laughs> of this. Uh, <laughs> that was a hint. <laughs> yes, yes, absolutely. I, but I, I, these things need to sink in and I, I cannot imagine that there will be sort of, this, this will be thematized by either theatre, film or literature, but it might take, uh, or, or performance or what have you. Um, but it's, it's, a, it's a very, very important recommendation. Also for the students, mm -hmm. if you have a paper to write or a <laughs> thesis, this is an interesting and very necessary case to be commented upon from a decolonial and feminist mm -hmm. perspective. Um, in, if there's not a very urgent question in the public, I would like to thank you, uh, Phoebe, from the bottom of my heart. You gave us a lot to chew on and to think about. You inspired us and you gave us even great ideas for urgent research to take on. Um, that's it. I would like to ask the public to turn on your microphones and to join me in a warm... Now this awful moment of saying goodbye, I, uh, finding yourself in your own room again. <laughs> <laughs> we are all so much looking forward to be in the same pub after a uh, doing gender lecture. Indeed, indeed. Thank you so much for this invitation and for having me over. It was such a pleasure being back. <laughs> back. Next time you'll get drunk together, Phoebe. <laughs> 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 ciao ciao bye bye thank you Phoebe bye. thank bye. you Phoebe thanks a lot Phoebe thank you Rosemary bye 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 bye